Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. That's a perfect situation. Ladies and gentlemen, David Cronenberg is with us. I was just thinking that maybe, of course, we would love to have you here, but given the fact that you are always interested in your films in technology and how it affects human being, maybe it's fitting that we see you for technology now. Yes, this is kind of a video drum thing. <laughs> exactly. So, um, uh, we have Pierre Sandling, of course, here, also the curator of the, of the exhibition. This exhibition has three major uh, sections, and uh, my question first is to Mr. David Cronenberg. When you saw the structure of this exhibition and what uh, Pierce made of it, did you see your work in it? Did you think, oh yes, this is exactly what I meant? Or did you think, wow, I don't know if I did this all, did all, all, this, all those things? Um, I thought that Pierce and his team were very creative and had created something that hadn't existed before, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I really think um, it's when you're making movies, especially the way movies have to be made these days, um, you really don't have control of an overall structure. You make the movie when you can. I, I like to point out that, for example, Dead Ringers, I wanted to make it 10 years before I actually got to make it. And if I had managed to get the financing and the actor to support the financing, I would have made that movie in 1978 instead of 1988. And um, so you don't really have control of a structure. It's just too difficult. You're, you're doing it film by film and it, they, they seem to take their own time. So seeing a structure created, I mean, it's really a structure that is created by analysis, uh, by critics, by film critics, and by people like Pierce and his team who can, who can take the time and the, have the perspective to, to shape it, to shape what, what has been done. But for me, I don't, I don't feel that I have any control over that, really. It really is a film-by-film -film process. And of course, there are many films that you try to make, you want to make, and you never do get to make, including for me some screenplays that I've written that never got made and so on. So that's why it's not for the filmmaker to do, to, to do this analysis. It's really for other people. We lost the actor who was supposed to play that role and at the last minute. And so uh, Gina Davis, who was, of course, playing the woman who is giving birth to this baby, said, David, you've got to do it. I don't want anybody else to be doing it. So I said, OK. It wasn't, it was, in other words, it wasn't an Alfred Hitchcock vanity moment for me. It was a, it was a matter of practical necessity. Well, I suppose for each film and each artifact, there would be a different history. Um, but in general, I have designers. You know, we have a, I have a production designer, and that person, who is usually Carol Spear, um, has, uh, working with her, many designers and modelists, uh, special effects people. Uh, Stéphane Dupuis is, is a, another uh, person who, who has done designing for me for uh, various creatures and so on. Um, and artifacts. So it really, it's a combination of, of course, it begins with the script, uh, and usually, and often, it's a script that I have written myself, um, but that's just the beginning, that's just the raw beginning. After that, I have quite a few people who work on, they, they make suggestions, they, uh, we do models that are attempts, that, that are sort of experiments, uh, and uh, finally, gradually, we come to something that I get excited about and I think will work. And uh, even at that point, I'm probably talking to my, my director of photography as well about how this artifact will look on screen. So it's really, it is a collaboration that, that begins with the concept and the script. But then, once you have to make it physically happen, uh, there are many people involved. And some of them are very complicated. For example, the the final creature that uh, Jeff Goldblum becomes in the fly, that, that involved many people, um, mechanical things. I mean, that was not, there was no computer uh, generating imagery, imagery at that time, so it was all physical. 
And so uh, it had to move and, and there had to be mechanics and puppeteering. So there were a lot of people involved. It's, it's never just me. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a, it is a real collaboration. And then, of course, you then want to work with brilliant people. And I have, I have been able to do that. You mentioned the last scene of The Fly, which is probably maybe my favorite moment from your cinema. I think it's the most tragic and shattering scene one of the most tragic and shattering scenes in the history of, of cinema and that's why I, wanted, I would like to ask if when you are involved in making all these artifacts, props and for example the creature that Jeff Goldblum becomes in the fly do you think always that it has to be, no matter how, uh, how, how much deformed the creature is or the artifact is basically it has to be human on some level? Yes, I mean I'm, I'm um... As a, as a child, I was what I call a junior entomologist. That is, I was very interested in insects and insect life because it seemed to me that, you know, we have people who keep thinking about creatures from other planets, alien life, and it always occurred to me that, it seemed to me that we have the most alien forms of life you could imagine right here on the planet Earth, and it's mostly insect life um, that is so strange and so bizarre and so fascinating. And so I was very much um, excited to create this new kind of creature. Uh, but it, 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 a fly, you know, has very dead eyes. You know, it has compound eyes. And they, they don't, to us, they, they are not, we can't relate to them. They're, they're sort of mechanical. It's like a lens uh, on a camera rather than a human eye where we, we see so much emotion and so much expression. And so I realized that I couldn't really be entomologically correct in designing that creature. It, it had to have some human empathy for us. And, and so that what meant that I had to make the eyes be much more human than any insect would ever have. So yes, uh, I had to, you know, it was a balance. And after all, it was supposed to be a combination of a human and, a, and an insect. So I felt it was legitimate that it should have slightly more human eyes than any insect would have. And so then this is, these are the kind of things, of course, you're always dealing with when you are creating something that has never existed before. Uh, and it's exciting and it's kind of dangerous and you, you want to not make a mistake. You know, you want to not, after all, it, as you say, it is the ending of the film. And the design of that creature could have um, shut the audience out. If, if it had not had sort of a human, very human element in there somewhere that we could see that the character uh, that Gina was playing also could see. I, I've always, I seem to have grown up knowing a lot about Freud. I didn't really know that much about Jung. Uh, and I certainly didn't know about Sabina Spielrein uh, until I started to do some research because of uh, the project, you know, because of uh, Christopher Hampton's screenplay and so on. And um, I always found the, the, the attempts by Freud to uh, understand something b below the surface of human life and human condition to be wonderful and intriguing. And uh, frankly, for me, it didn't really matter if Freud was right about anything. Uh, if he was correct, if he was accurate in a medical way, because I find his writing so humanistic and so intelligent and so inventive. Um, I love Freud's writing. Uh, and in fact, he is considered a master of the German language as well. So um, then to, 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 I just found the, the, the sort of triangle, um, which, which was not well known. I mean, people didn't know much about Sabina Spuron until the 1970s when some uh, writings of hers and diaries of hers were discovered uh, in a basement. And I forget whether it was Cologne, what city it was. Um, and so it was a, a whole new exciting um, uh, perspective on, on psychoanalysis and the history of psychoanalysis. And so I, I really, uh, I also found that the relationship, the psychoanalytic relationship was a new thing in the early 1900s. It was a new relationship between human beings. It had never existed before. There was you know, always the doctor-patient relationship, but this was really quite unique and new to the 20th century. And uh, 
So I, I was curious to, to explore in cinema uh, the nature of the psychoanalytic relationship where you have uh, someone trying to bring out uh, unspoken, unconscious uh, dynamics of, of a patient in that strange relationship which is very intimate and yet very sort of rigorously distanced the way Freud wanted it to be. And then you have Jung who, who came first to be a psychoanalyst in the Freudian mold and then kind of uh, revolted against his master and, and, and began to develop his own understanding of psychoanalysis in a more what I would think of actually as a kind of uh, uh, religious, spiritualist uh, way, very much not Freudian. In other words, Freud was an atheist and I wouldn't say that Jung was that. So um, all of that, and then you throw in this Russian uh, woman who, who really inspired and brought out many things in Jung, even though she wasn't credited for it. I think it, it was just very exciting material for me. In terms of casting, did you think, or are you thinking, or did you think uh, in, in The Fly or other movies or video drama, when you cast the film, to get the actors who also physically uh, fit the part and the um, the deformations and the artifact, the props that will uh, would be interacting with them on the set. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for any film, the actor is your main special effect, you know. So you you, however, it's so difficult the casting question because you have to cast someone who's enough of a star to support whatever the budget is. If you have a big budget, you need a bigger star. Uh, all, even small independent movies are always looking for actors who have some name, some presence, because it's very competitive, the publicity, all of that. This is, for, for a filmmaker, this is not a creative question. Uh, this is really a marketing question, and it happens before you even cast the film. So you, the, the director of the film, are looking for the actor who is physically and emotionally and in terms of artistry the perfect actor for your film but you at the same time you can't cast just anybody you want you have to think of all of the other aspects and then of course you have to find an actor who wants to play the role and Jeff Goldman was not the first person that we approached uh, I had uh, there were there were other actors who were intimidated by the role because they, they didn't they felt that at a certain point when you start to put rubber on your face actors think I can't act through that rubber I literally had an, a very famous actor who I won't name say I couldn't I can't act through that rubber how can I be an actor when I have all that stuff on my face um, and so it, I was very lucky with Jeff I mean not, not only uh, did he have that so expressive face with the so extreme, as you say, eyes and so on? Uh, but he was, you know, that, that character is kind of a nerd, he's kind of a science nerd, and Jeff has that aspect to him. And yet, at a certain point, he becomes kind of strangely heroic. And suddenly we're seeing his body, and it turns out that Jeff has a terrific body and, and was able to do some of the physical things in the film. Um, before we had to have stuntman involved, which made it so much easier for me to create those scenes uh, where he becomes almost superhuman in his strength and so on. Um, and certainly the first actors that we approached uh, to play the role didn't, were not physically fit that way that Jeff was. So we were very lucky with him. We, we, I really did get, I think, the absolutely perfect uh, actor, and, and as I had not just because of his eyes, but obviously, once again, it's the physical actor you are photographing, not the idea of the actor or the emotion of the actor. It's all expressed through the body, through the face, and, and once again, it's a physical medium, very physical medium. <laughs> Yes, I've actually been invited before, uh, and, and uh, I know my, my director of photography, Peter Peter Sushitsky, is um, is um, is very aware of the festival and, and, and very enthusiastic about it. So I would love to come. I mean, it's just it's circumstances. Uh, 
for, have made it not possible for me to come this time, but uh, uh, I actually hope possibly to make a trip uh, to see the exhibit before it's finished. It's possible that I can do that. I would love to do that. Um, and yes, I think celebrating cinematography is, is, is a fantastic uh, approach to movie making because the collaboration between the director and the director of photography is so crucial. It's absolutely crucial to the making of the movie um, in so many ways. There's, there's no closer relationship on a film than there is between the cinematographer and the director. So uh, a wonderful uh, idea, a wonderful festival, and yes, I would love to come. Thank you to David Cronenberg. Thank you for being with us today. We hope to see you in person uh, in the in the in the not so distant fu distant future. Let's say that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, and have a good day, good night. I don't know what time it is in Canada right now. It's uh, 10 to 11 in the morning for me. This is very early. <laughs> I can relate to that. So have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.